It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to the Miller Center's American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. In this era of bitter division between political parties and paralyzed government in Washington, D.C., Americans often despair that our politics must be more toxic than at any previous time and that there seems to be no solution for a gridlocked Congress and stubbornly uncooperative national leaders. Our guest today says in a new book that both of those assumptions are untrue, that America was stuck in a remarkably similar way a century ago, and how that enormous political logjam was ultimately broken by President Theodore Roosevelt and others may be a prescription for healing our corrosive political process today. Michael Wolrush is the author of Unreasonable Men, Theodore Roosevelt and the Republican Rebels Who Created Progressive Politics. Thanks for joining us, Michael. I'm glad. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. We, we all know the basic story of Teddy Roosevelt, and some of us know it really well. We know the Rough Rider. You know, we know that guy, this funny guy, uh, uh, full of bravado, but I don't think we really understand him politically very well. And I think the fact that he was a Republican is actually confusing to us because he's associated with a kind of politics that we don't really associate with the GOP today. Um, though I confess, I'm not even sure I could sort out all of that. And so, but, but, so as he's an emerging politician, political figure in New York City first and then later for the whole state. He was a Republican, staunch Republican through and through. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, furious with, uh, with his, his uh, cousin Franklin who, who, when he joined the Democrats. Uh, so uh, as a, as a wealthy New Yorker, so there was no real question. The Republican Party was really the way for, was, was, was bound to be Roosevelt's party. And particularly it, given the corruption of the Democratic machine in New York, for him to be a, a reformer cleaning up uh, state politics, it made a lot of sense for him to be a Republican. Uh, it also didn't, you know, it, it didn't have, the Republicans didn't have quite the, the, didn't have the reputation of conservatives uh, that they do today. There were, as I mentioned, there were conservatives in both parties. And uh, so it was, there were a few other reformers uh, in both parties. And Roosevelt saw him, himself as the man to reform the Republican Party uh, and then take, that, take those reforms and bring them to first to New York State, New York City as well, and then national. These days, the word progressive has been revived and is used by a lot of people again in American discussions as a replacement for the word liberal, which came to be reviled by a lot of people. And a lot of liberals became kind of embarrassed about that word. Now people love to use the word progressive. And so a subtitle, like the one in your book, is confusing. The idea that it was a Republican and some other a Republican president and some other rebel Republicans who created progressive politics. How can that be? Well, many people don't realize that the ideological divisions that we have today uh, were not uh, along party lines. Were, it was not always that way. And in fact, in the, at the turn of the 20th century, it looked as if it could go either way. Both parties, Democrats and Republicans, were divided between uh, what we now call conservatives uh, and uh, reformers that we now call progressives. Uh, and there was, a, there was an, a very strong insurgency in the Republican Party and a very push, a very strong push to make the Republican Party the Progressive Party. Now, ultimately, it didn't go that way. What did progressive mean in that period of time? And what was, what was the division of the parties and what did they stand for immediately before what we call the rise of the progressives? The term progressive was not really used, at least in America, in a political context, at least not in, in any ideological sense. The, uh, there, were, uh, there were reformers, uh, they were sometimes referred to as half-breeds, as in half-Republican, uh, but there was, no, there was no clear ideological uh, concept or label at that time. The parties were divided more by uh, region than by ideology. 
Uh, they had the, 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 Repu the, the Democrats were strong in the South and in the big cities uh, like New York, Mo uh, Milwaukee, Chicago. The, and the Republicans dominated pretty much, much everywhere else. And in fact, Republic Republicans had dominated American politics pretty much through the Civil War, with the, uh, since the Civil War, with a few exceptions. And Republicans also were the political home of essentially all African Americans, wherever they were, even though there were increasingly increasing difficulties for African Americans to actually vote in the South. But wherever black people were, they tended to be Republicans. Ab absolutely. The Democrat was, Democrats were the party of the white South, first and foremost. Uh, so this is the, the, the height of, of, uh, of America's Industrial Revolution. And we have big, big tycoons uh, becoming, becoming richer and richer, more powerful. There's a lot of consolidation mm -hmm. among corporations. You know, the small companies that people were used to uh, were growing very large, and there were fewer and fewer of them every year, much to the alarm of, of many of the citizens of the country. The income uh, and wealth inequality was soaring. Uh, to, un to levels never before seen in the United States. Uh, there was economic instability. Every 10 years, there would be a, a tremendous panic, uh, they called it then, you know, what, what we now call a, a recession or a financial crisis that leads to a recession or even a depression. Uh, the environment was deteriorating. The industries were, were exploiting all the country's natural resources and polluting a lot of the waterways. Uh, so there were, there were a lot of interesting parallels uh, between uh, now, uh, where we again have income inequality and again have uh, environmental challenges, uh, there was also a lot of uh, corporate influence in government that people were not uh, used to. The the these these big uh, these tycoons these these trusts uh, used their their financial clout to influence government. The local parties were in each state were run by political machines. There would be uh, a boss, and the boss would hand out. Uh, jobs uh, to uh, to his supporters, the uh, in in return for, for for them drumming up votes. It was called the the patronage system, uh, but he needed money to to run his operation, and that came from business. I mean, they would make big campaign contributions, or did they buy politicians off? Or I mean, what what how did how did it work? Um, that could be it could be bribery. There were there were plenty of uh, delegate delegates bribed or, or votes bought. Uh, but a lot of it was uh, a form that we're familiar with today. A lot of it was just campaign contributions. Uh, and that certainly happened at the federal level. Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who despite uh, being, you know, coming out very strongly against the trusts, uh, his campaign uh, raised a lot of money from uh, the, the large tycoons. Uh, uh, J.D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, uh, a lot of the railroad tycoons, et cetera. And so Teddy Roosevelt is a rich guy from Oyster Bay, New York. Uh, who, what role is he playing in all of this in the, in the decade before he emerges as a, as a national figure? Roosevelt, as, as uh, everyone knows, was, he, was, he was somebody different. He was, he was idiosyncratic. He was his own man. And he cut a rare, very different course through politics than, than people were used to. He was always a reformer. Uh, even uh, even early on as a, as a legislature in the state government of uh, New York, uh, he pushed for reforms. He was, he was anti-corruption. He was trying to change the patronage system uh, to, do, uh, to switch to a more metacratic uh, way of, of recognizing and elevating uh, public servants. Um, but he was not necessarily, he, he was not the crusader that he is often remembered as and, and, and in the, you know, Ken Byrne had a uh, Roosevelt special which presented him as this fighter, this, this, uh, uh, this man who, you know, wouldn't take no and, and uh, you know, wouldn't compromise with his enemies. And that was actually not Theodore Roosevelt. He was very cautious about it. Uh, he, he wanted to, to uh, change the country incrementally, one step at a time. This was partly because, as you said, he was, uh, he, he, he came from old money and he, he was concerned about the populist agitation that was happening, particularly out uh, out west, what we now call the Midwest. But uh, uh, he he was concerned that it was too too drastic, too violent, too dangerous. Uh, but the other thing is, he was a very practical man, and he knew that if he uh, pushed for uh, you know aggressive measures to change the country, that the conservative powers in government would shut them down. This happened in New York State and happened also once he became uh, president. The, uh, so he would uh, work with his opponents and compromise with them uh, to, 
uh, get as much change as he felt he could accomplish. And he, Roosevelt emerges as a, as a uh, widely recognized figure, first as the police commissioner for New York City, right? Uh, and then later becomes governor. But by the time he's governor of New York, he's not at all popular with other Republicans. Well, he had a lot of conflicts with the Republican establishment because the, the, the Republican establishment and the Democratic establishment uh, were, both very, were both conservative. Uh, and so here was this 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 young guy because he he was a young guy and he was he, from this patrician class that didn't usually go into politics, and all of a sudden he's jumping in there and and saying you know we got to go after these corrupt judges and we, you know we got to stop the the influence of the corporations and we got to do you know, regulation which you know, nobody was uh, thinking about at that time, the uh, and and the, the establishment pushed back, uh, and so he he frequently found himself uh, at odds with them. And uh, in fact, you know, one of the, the greatest stories about the rise of Theodore Roosevelt is the reason he ended up vice president was the Republican establishment in New York was trying to sideline him. They wanted him out of New York because he was governor there and they felt mucking up the state. Uh, the vice presidency at that time was a, a dead end job that, that no one wanted. And they thought, well, they, they maneuver uh, Roosevelt uh, to get in there, uh, then, then he'll be out of our hair and we won't have to think about him again. And uh, you know, there was a, one of the big uh, Republican leaders from Ohio, who was a national leader, uh, warned them at the time. Like the, the, he, you know, he said to, the, to these guys from New York, don't you realize that, that he'll be just one life away from the presidency? Nine months later, the assassination. And Theodore Roosevelt became president. Yeah, so it's one of the most delicious uh, ironies in American political history, really, that, uh, that the Republicans of New York really thought they were done with Teddy Roosevelt uh, when they had installed him as vice president, and look what happened. When was it and how was it that then this, uh, this political situation that reminds us of the present uh, begins to emerge in that period of time, and who were the other key characters? So there were the, the political, the Republican Party at that time was dominated really by two figures. Uh, there was, uh, so one was the Speaker of the House. He wasn't, he, he became Speaker of the House a couple of years into Roosevelt's presidency, but he was, he was up and coming for a while and he was very powerful. His name was, uh, was Joseph Gurney, uh, Joseph, Can Joseph Gurney Cannon. Um, the, uh, but everyone called him Uncle Joe. He was this, this irascible old, uh, old time, you know, raised, uh, old time politician, raised in a log cabin, uh, spoke with the drawl, uh, loved to smoke cigars all the time, was always chewing a cigar, <laughs> swigging whiskey, cursing, telling uh, little uh, Bible tales. Uh, everyone loved this guy. He was, it was, he was, uh, uh, he was, he was incredibly charming uh, and he worked his way up through the party, uh, but also very conservative. He, uh, he, believe that the government should be as small as possible and, and stay out of uh, everyone's lives as much as possible. And he used his power as Speaker of the House uh, to essentially shut down any reform. And he was immensely powerful, probably the most powerful Speaker of the House we've had in American history. Uh, at that time, uh, congressmen could not uh, speak on the floor without the, the Speaker's permission. Uh, they could not uh, motion uh, a bill. Uh, they could, no bills could leave committee without his approval. Uh, and he used that power to, to exact incredible loyalty uh, from the Republican Party, even from Democrats, because if you bucked Uncle Joe, uh, then that was, you, you didn't get to, none of your, your pet projects that you wanted to bring back to your home state, they would never get voted in. So everyone did what, what Uncle Joe said. The, uh, there was another, there was a similar leader in the Senate, another Republican, but very different from Uncle Joe. Uh, his name was uh, Nelson Aldrich. Uh, he's actually the, the grandfather of Nelson Rockefeller, uh, uh, who was governor of New York. Um, Nelson Aldrich was from Rhode Island, and he was, uh, he was much more of an East Coast guy. He was, uh, he was chums with uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, and a lot of the big trust leaders at the time. He didn't, uh, you know, the, in those days, senators wore these, these long frock coats that were, they were called Prince Albert frock coats because uh, Prince Albert uh, had popularized them. The, and they would, you know, they stand up and they'd you know, do their speeches with their, their hands tucked into their, their uh, lapels. Uh, Nelson Aldrich was, he, he dressed like a businessman. He dressed in, uh, in a more conventional uh, suit. He 
uh, spoke quietly, didn't like, to, didn't like to talk on the Senate floor. He worked behind the scenes. And he had, he had three allies, of, of which he was pretty much the leader. Uh, they were called the Big Four. And they ruled the Senate. They, used, they had the power over the committees. And they used their power uh, to pass whatever legislation that essentially they wanted, or shut down the legislation that they didn't want. So you had a very similar uh, uh, law called by conservatives on the Senate and in Congress. And Roosevelt, you know, having been elevated to president now, all of a sudden had to deal with these two guys uh, who regarded him with great skepticism. And he dealt with it by working with them. Uh, he, in, particularly in his first term, he didn't challenge them. He, he let them deal with domestic policy. He focused on uh, international policy, which he was uh, much more interested in. They, was, they were much more willing to give him a free hand on. Now, Roosevelt was, if, if I recall correctly, uh, was actually very concerned about whether he would be nominated for the presidency in 1904. That was part of, part of his uh, passiveness, I guess, in that period. Uh, is that he's not at all sure that, uh, even though he's ended up in the White House, that the Republicans will, will want to keep him there in 1904. I mean, is that part of what's going on, that he's uh, trying to not uh, rock the boat too much? Absolutely. I mean, he was, he was a political animal. He, was, he felt insecure about the way he had become president. He hadn't been elected in his own right. He was concerned about opposition in the Republican Party, with good reason, because if he had pushed too hard, uh, they, they might have, and there was even talk, uh, of running someone against him uh, for the nomination in 1904. So that was part of it. Uh, he also felt just that he didn't have a mandate. You know, he had, he had uh, Somebody else come into chair. office right. by accident, <clears throat> exactly. Uh, so he was hesitant for that reason. What is it about the, the conflict between these three figures and him and the Republican Party and then the person you talk about a great deal in the book, Bob La Follette, um, Robert La Follette, um, where does he come into this, and how do the how do the politics begin to unfold? The uh, so Bob Lafollette was he was a, a first a congressman, then a governor, then a senator from Wisconsin, and he was a really crucial figure and a really fascinating figure in this era. And while you know while the, the title of my book is uh, includes Theodore Roosevelt and doesn't you know, was adding Lafollette would have been too long. Uh, it's really about both these men. La Follette uh, is, is not nearly as uh, well remembered as, as Roosevelt, with, you know, in, in large part for good reason. But I do think that, uh, that not enough attention has been paid to him recently, particularly as we get back to some of the, some, some of the progressive politics and some of the, the, the populism that La Follette championed uh, 100 years ago. I mean, if he, Bob La Follette would have, been, would have been at the head of Occupy Wall Street if, uh, if he were around today. Um, he was he was a reformer like Roosevelt, but he was had much more uh, aggressive about it, much less willing to compromise. Uh, La Follette set his sights on the conservative uh, the conservative Republican establishment in Wisconsin, and essentially took down the machine. He he fought for uh, eight years uh, through through three uh, governor's elections before he was elected. Uh, governor of Wisconsin, and then set about uh, radically changing the system. He wanted to he wanted to regulate the the railroad industry and the lumber industry, which you know hadn't been done certainly not in Wisconsin. Uh, he wanted to uh, bypass the, the eliminate the caucuses because the caucuses were very corrupt. The the many of the delegates were bribed, uh, and they used this to hold their uh, hold power in Wisconsin. La Follette. Uh, despised this. Uh, he wanted voters to elect their nominees, their party nominees, directly, and pioneered this direct primary, which is now the, the standard uh, in, most, in almost all states, uh, with a few exceptions. And La Follette, then, is the, so he's a Republican who's outraged by the way the Republican Party works as, and also outraged by the Democratic Party. And so he's this insurgent leading a larger group of populist insurgents against against both parties in a sense. So he's our Tea Party leader, if we try to make a historical parallel. He's, I, I often compare him to uh, Ted Cruz from Texas. He is the, he, he is, I would say, Cruz's mirror image, or Cruz is his mirror image, uh, where they use many of the same tactics uh, that, you know, LaFollette used these very sensational tactics. He was, he, he liked to filibuster. He would refuse to compromise. He pushed for bills that had absolutely no chance of passing, uh, knowing that they would go down in flames. But he did it 
uh, to draw attention and converts to his cause. He would uh, he'd push these bills, and then when they failed, as he knew they would, he would in the next election he would go around uh, first Wisconsin, later around the whole United States, and he would he would talk to people about his bills, and then he would read out the roll call of who voted for these bills. And many people didn't realize that uh, that their that their leaders, that their representatives were voting against these bills that they appreciated. So La Follette used these to primary conservatives in the Republican Party, much the way Tea Party, uh, the Tea Party does today. So he was, he was the first Republican insurgent. He was just a progressive insurgent. And, and we can overdraw these historical parallels and go too far with them. Nonetheless, it's, it's interesting, I think, to try to, to find these comparisons because in the current political dynamic, uh, most sort of conventional uh, political activists, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, look somewhat disdainfully at the Tea Party. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in America about that the Tea Party is an obstructionist element, that, it's an, it's re that the refusal of its supporters to compromise uh, is a real problem and is obstructing uh, what's happening in American life. Uh, so there's a lot of criticism of this vigilance around, no, we want it all, we're and we're going to vote over and over again to repeal the Affordable Care Act because we think it ought to be repealed. And we don't care that it's not going to go anywhere. It's a symbolic gesture. And that seems very parallel to what you're talking about. What is viewed as one of the most important changes in American political evolution. Uh, it, it was absolutely parallel. The La Follette was despised by, uh, certainly by the conservative establishment uh, in the Republican Party, but even by more moderates. Theodore Roosevelt uh, never liked La Follette. He felt that he was, La Follette was, was getting in the way of, of the, the incremental change that he was trying to do because he'd be, he'd be working with the conservatives to pass these bills and La Follette would be out there pushing these, these you know, much more radical bills that could never be passed. And, and Roosevelt, he, Roosevelt, who was, he was so practical, he, couldn't, he didn't even get it. He, he, he sort of looked at the follow and would be like, what, what is he thinking? He can't, he can't pass these bills. He knows he can't pass these bills. He must, he must be doing it just to basically raise his own profile and, you know, because he wants to run for president uh, in, in the same way that people, you know, accusations that people make against Ted Cruz today. And which also sounds a lot like Barack Obama, the way you've just described Teddy Roosevelt, um, uh, as this president who uh, doesn't have uh, the, the uh, political power to push his own agenda through Congress as, as freely as he would like, or really at all at this point, uh, but is baffled by these symbolic actions by this insurgent group over here, uh, and who is widely criticized for, for not being able to somehow negotiate this, but, but also I think maybe just doesn't get the 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 idealism of the Tea Party. That's very fair and very astute. And you know, I, I you know, writing this book, I, you know, I didn't. The book is all history. Uh, with you know, outside the preface, I don't talk about today. But there are so many parallels that I think come through uh, from this era. And I think one of them is the the approaches of of Obama and uh, Theodore Roosevelt. They were very different characters, but their their strategy, their governing strategy was uh, legislative strategy was very similar. They, they sized up the opposition. They said, well, you know, I don't think I can pass this bill that I'd like to pass, so I'm going to figure out, you know, I'm going to scale it back and push the bill that I think can pass, and they'd negotiate for a bit and try to push something and then take the best bill they could get. Uh, and Which also sounds very Clintonian, I mean, in terms of a successful Democratic president at that, uh, but that, that Clinton pulled off very well, but that in the end, Obama, beyond his early years, has actually not been able to get much at all. It hasn't even been able to make that work as a legislative strategy. What we saw in this, this era 100 years ago, so much like today, was that when you're dealing with, with uh, an opposition that is absolutely not interested in compromise uh, and is essentially uh, trying to shut down any kind of uh, movement whatsoever, uh, compromise doesn't work. You get, you get uh, what La Follette called half a loaf measures that, that, uh, that look that, that look good and seem like you're getting something done, but they really just, but really just sates people's appetites without really changing uh, the status quo. And so LaFall would argue it's better to, to uh, that, that sometimes half a loaf is actually worse than no loaf at all. Better to push for the big bill that, uh, that th what he felt was the right bill and lose and then use that loss 
uh, to hammer your opponents in the next election rather than to you know, get some compromise watered down bill that won't really change things. Yeah, very much like the elections of 2014. Uh, but I guess if we extend the uh, historical comparison all the way out, what this tells us is that uh, in another few years, Barack Obama will join up with the Tea Party and become leader of that <laughs> faction. <laughs> Maybe that's going too far. Uh, uh, it can't, can't be the bull moose. That's been done. He's got to have another like party name. Exactly. While these changes are happening and government is extending out into places it's never been before and there's a democratization of democracy happening uh, unlike anything seen before, what is happening to African Americans? Not much, unfortunately, at this time. There was uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, had some, you know, he was like like many people in the era, he had, he had racist ideas, uh, first of all. He was... Um, he was more, you know, much more willing to meet with with black leaders. With certain, he, he kind of divide up between, you know, the the uh, uh, African Americans that he uh, felt were uh, trustworthy and reasonable versus the the, the hoi polloi that he was uh, very skeptical of. Uh, so he there were he he did make uh, some inroads, but he also. Uh, you know, had some, some failures in that score. There's an incident in Brownsville, Texas that becomes a sort of seminal event in terms of race for Roosevelt. Uh, what, what was it that happened with those soldiers? Uh, so there were reports of a rampage by, by black soldiers uh, in the town of Brownsville, Texas. And these, these reports, you know, there's, there's much debate about what really happened, uh, but the, the reports were not very credible. It certainly seemed to be exaggerated. Uh, and uh, but you know these were white people saying that black people had come and and uh, and killed someone and menaced our town and you know, something has to be done about these black troops and Roosevelt uh, uh, demanded an investigation and the investigators went in and and you know talked to the soldiers and nobody admitted anything and uh, so Roosevelt was like well you know these you know that's typical of of, uh, of these uh, you know, African Americans, of course, he referred to as, as Negro soldiers, that they you know, cover things up and they're dishonest and shifty, and I'm just gonna uh, uh, dishonorably discharge all of them. Uh, even though cl certainly uh, all of them, if any of them, actually uh, conducted this, this rampage. And he was attacked by, uh, to their credit, some of the conservative Republicans uh, were, um, uh, were what we would now call liberal on race issues. And some of the conservative Republicans criticized Roosevelt uh, for doing this, and it, it did create a, a split within his party over this. Um, but for the most part, not much was, you know, Taft was, was trying to con uh, uh, conciliate the South. Uh, Wilson, of course, was, you know, was a Democrat and you know, was, was famously racist. Um, so you know, there was talk about, concern about lynching, and there was reporting about about lynching and some of the, 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 what we now call Jim Crow laws uh, from that era, but there was not a lot uh, being accomplished on behalf of America's, African Americans. Yeah, I think it's one of the other really remarkable junctures uh, in, in our history, of our, in our more recent history of that. This is this moment when really for the first time uh, government at various levels begins to be employed on a significant scale to deal with poverty and working conditions and uh, income inequality. And if one thinks those are good things, doesn't matter, but this gigantic event that changes the lives of millions and millions of people and generations of people in very dramatic ways uh, and then sets the stage for what comes uh, in the New Deal legislation in the 1930s. And meanwhile, you have, though, in the same way that Roosevelt uh, represented an openness to some of this, but a timidity about some of it as well, he's the same way on race. He comes in uh, a, a, a sort of a nominal racist um, of the time, an average racist, but probably not a venal racist, uh, believes that he's affectionate toward African Americans, uh, though he clearly views them as in a lesser status does one radical thing. I don't think you discussed this in the book, but when he invites Booker T. Washington yeah. to the White House to dinner, uh, and, uh, and Booker T. Washington sits there with his daughter, uh, and much of the country goes into uh, apoplexy over, over the scene of this. There was an editorial in a newspaper in Mississippi that said, we shall have to kill a thousand of them uh, to, to send the lesson that this, that this abomination, this kind of abomination couldn't occur. And so it's remarkable that he starts there 
But then by the end of his presidency, uh, he has essentially abandoned all interests in African Americans in this picture. And then we end up with Woodrow Wilson, who's not just a famous racist, but an inveterate white supremacist. I think Roosevelt was very chastened by the response to his meeting with Booker T. Washington, and that's part of the reason he, he said, you know, well, this is not the fight that we're going to have right now. Uh, to the point about, about the, the equality, Democrats in their party platform would talk about they're the party of equality. But by equality, they meant equality between rich and poor. They didn't mean equality between uh, blacks and whites. Uh, it's also fascinating, I think, to remember in a conversation like this what things were like in America then, you know, what the reality on the ground was for the American people, uh, because we lose track of that. Uh, it is a world in which there's no Social Security. Uh, almost no one has any kind of retirement benefits, no normal people, regular people, or any sort of security in their old age. Uh, most people in rural parts of the country, certainly in the rural South, are living in third world conditions. Uh, there's no running water anywhere. Obviously, there's not electricity yet. Uh, there are hardly any paved roads anywhere in the Deep South and in much of the West. Uh, local governments are, are extremely small and controlled by the parties. There's almost no local taxation. The federal government lives off primarily off the tariff. There's no income tax. And so we really have a, a world in which both government on the local and the state level and the federal level is starved of resources uh, across the board and in fact doesn't do a great deal beyond the, these, these sort of international matters and defense. And so a lot of what this, this struggle is about is not just sort of high-minded idealism versus reactionary conservatism, it's really about whether the country is gonna remain like that, part third world, uh, or if it's going to become something else in the 20th century. Yeah, I, I would put it a little a little differently. I mean, people weren't certainly weren't clamoring for Social Security or, or health care uh, and the sort of things that we're looking for today. But they they felt I, I think one of the strongest uh, um, ideas and concerns and passions are running through uh, the electric electorate was that people felt very much vulnerable. Uh, they felt they, there were a lot of changes going on uh, through through industry, and they felt the country was spinning, was out of their control, and it was being you know they, and they, they pointed fingers at the people who they thought were controlling it, which was the the, the, the rich bankers and industrialists out east. Uh, the so so and it was that vulnerability that the the sense that sort of the world was unpredictable with these these financial crises and and inflation was was a big concern. They didn't call it that, but they were concerned about the cost of living uh, very much. Uh, and they saw you know, this growing class divisions uh, between the very rich and the very poor. And these are, these are, almost, these are more universal concerns and ideas than um, simply, uh, the, you know, simply retirement, say, or, or health care, that sort of thing. But that's, and it's, I think, ideas that we, that still resonate today. Yeah, not, not unlike how uh, after the economic collapse of 2008, uh, that it was not a very ideological thing for people to have the sense that these ba distant bankers in New York City who had gotten all these benefits uh, from the government in the wake of the collapse, uh, that somehow they were responsible for the, the difficulties of everybody else, whether middle class or poor, uh, and a sense of, of frustration and outrage toward that, whether it's true or not, but, that, but, but a very similar kind of, a public reaction. Uh, certainly, and, and that's on the, yeah, on the left and the right, as you say. I mean, there's, there's a strong sort of anti-Wall Street thread uh, that runs uh, through uh, the Tea Party. And we, we see it, uh, as we saw it in, in Virginia, when Eric Cantor lost his seat to somebody who was, who was, uh, was concerned about cronian, cronyism and, and corporate influence. Uh, so so that's, still, that's still with us uh, across the political spectrum, and I think is having an increasing uh, uh, impact and effect on American politics, much yeah. as it was a century ago. Uh, it's not so much that the parallels predict the future for us, uh, but they help us to reset our frame uh, and maybe blank out some of our misperceptions and conceptions of the present, uh, such as that it's just interesting that La Follette and his followers who end up being historical in the sense of the big changes that occur to America, which are generally regarded as positive changes, nonetheless were viewed uh, by people like Teddy Roosevelt as problematic people, shrill and extreme and inflexible, uh, in the same way that there's a real tendency among moderates and others to view the Tea Party today and to be dismissive of them, and in particular to dismiss their idealism, uh, which if 
regardless of what one thinks about their politics, uh, actually I think the idealism of the Tea Party is, is pretty legitimate. I, I absolutely agree. And, and I, it's not just the Tea Party, it's also on the left. I mean, you're, you're starting to see a uh, resurgence of the Democratic left. Uh, the most prominent figure is Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts, of course. Uh, but there are uh, a number of others uh, who, are, who, are, who are in office, or running for office, who are uh, embracing these sort of old-time, populist, progressive, anti-corporate uh, ideas and rhetoric. And they're, you know, the Democratic, the Democratic establishment is sort of looking, looking a bit askance at them. They, they, they uh, they're want to harness the passion, but they're concerned about getting unelectable people uh, running for office. And I think, uh, you know, as you know, as we move towards uh, uh, 2016 and, and elections after that, we're going to start to see a stronger and stronger Democrat insurgency uh, as well. You say in the introduction of the book something uh, very grand and sweeping uh, that if you had written it in a uh, in a history PhD dissertation, would have been uh, you'd have been slapped down by your major professor. But you say. History offers a solution to our modern political dysfunction. <laughs> what is that solution? The intuitive idea that you need to uh, pra- approach uh, politics practically in the short term and, and work for changes uh, piecemeal one at a time because that's the best that you can get in the current context is often the wrong way of looking at things. That it, can very much help you get elected, and it can very much help you pass some legislation. Uh, but it's not a long-term view of politics. This is where uh, Roosevelt and the Fall differed very much, because Roosevelt was, uh, up until you know after his presidency, when when he became more of a crusader, he was very much looking at the next election and looking at well, what is my you know what can I get done during this term? Whereas La Follet was taking a longer view of the uh, of politics and saying, look, it's not enough to you know pass this bill or or win this election. You need to change uh, the way people understand politics. You need to change the power structure uh, that it has been that 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 is ruling the country right now, and that's going to mean some short-term losses. Uh, you know, if if we push these these ideas and these candidates that can't win, but in the long run. Uh, we can persuade people that what we're doing is right. And I, I think it was a very astute way of uh, looking at politics. I think it's something that the Tea Party has been doing very much and very effectively. And in fact, the, I think it was even before, it, I, I, I track the conservative insurgency to go back at least until the 1970s, if not before that, um, the, uh, back even to, to Goldwater. Uh, but there's been this trend of a, a long-term view of how are we going to change the Republican Party and make it more conservative and more consistent with our ideas. And they've been very effective at doing that. The uh, Democrats, I think, have been taking a much more pragmatic view of politics, and you know, it's particularly initiated by President Clinton with his triangulation of you know keeping ourselves in power. And I think Democrats have gained in the short term by this. Uh, but at the expense of the long term. So it's important not to lose sight of the long term, and it's important to be willing to, to lose uh, in order to win uh, the hearts and minds of, of the country, which is, which is really what drives uh, politics and, more particularly, what, dri- what drives political change, which is the, the goal here. I guess you would look at New York City and the election of Mayor de Blasio as, a, as an example of this insurgency on the left, uh, of a redefining of what democratic politics mean and moving significantly to the left uh, in New York City. Uh, that, that's a version of these events on the left. And then on the right is the Tea Party, uh, as we understand a little more clearly, I think. And then you've got Barack Obama, who, yes, has played this, uh, this mediator in chief, who, who, but who really never was able to mediate very much, uh, but who did force through his one great legislative achievement in terms of the Affordable Care Act, whether you like it or don't, but it's a consequential uh, legislative achievement, did it in a completely uncompromising way with no Republicans involved, is battered all the time uh, for that. But by your argument, you would say that actually, I think, that that's the one part of the Obama era which will stand up as having been a principled achievement, even though it may well have led to uh, really serious injury to the to the to the ability of the Democratic Party to remain in power. 
the Obama administration started out very much trying to compromise with the Republican parties and only very belatedly uh, adopted the strategy of just of going uh, on their own. And I think, in fact, if they had started with that strategy earlier, they might have gotten a health care plan more like what many of the Democrats actually wanted, something that was, that was a little bit more ambitious when, than, when they, than what they got. So the solution uh, that history gives us is more polarization. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, I think yes. Uh, the, I think many, you know, many of the greatest periods of, American, of political change in America have come about uh, have have emerged from periods of great polarization. Uh, the civil, you know, the the, the uh, elimination of slavery in the Civil War, for example, or the FDR's New uh, New Deal. Like these were very polarized times, and there was a there was a, a knockdown, drawn out fight for two very different ideologies, and one side won, and were able to enact the changes that they, uh, you know, that they wanted to accomplish. Now it's not; it's much more difficult in the United States than it is in other countries with a parliamentary system because we've got all the the checks and balances. So you really have to win big in order to uh, accomplish these. But I think, in the current context where nothing's really happening anyway, you know, I don't see in the foreseeable future the two parties coming together and saying, "Oh well, you know, here's all these great things that we can agree on, and you know, we can get some you know some important change through." I, I don't see it happening. I think I think we have to have this fight, and and there's got to be a winner essentially. And it looked like that winner uh, was clear. Uh, in, in even in 2012, uh, it looked like that uh, even though uh, the Democrats and President Obama had had lots of problems and popularity difficulties, uh, it looked like then 2012 settled that in fact this was the predominant. Uh, political movement in America, and there was a lot of talk about the Republican Party reforming itself in various ways and becoming more open to, uh, to other kinds of people other than elderly white men. But there's also been a real retrenchment uh, around, and there's a version of that from this historical story as well, isn't there? Well, I mean, that, that's the nature of politics, right? You'll have a big leap, and then the, 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 the party in power will lose popularity eventually, you know, which uh, happened at, by the end of Wilson's second term. Uh, and then the, and then there'll be a, a retrenchment, and it'll be you know another uh, a couple of decades of, before you have another big leap. Um, I don't think the Democrats made you know made a big leap uh, when they uh, when they returned to power in uh, in the in Congress in 2006, and then in the, with the presidency in 2008. Uh, I think they were. Uh, it was not a very ideological party at that point. It was a very practical party, and they were uh, they they became the the big tent party that the Republicans used to be back before the the Tea Parties, uh, and as a result, made it difficult for them to to uh, accomplish a lot of change because they were relying on conservative Democrats who weren't on board for uh, for serious changes. Uh, so how is it and why is it that there is this transformation of Teddy Roosevelt that becomes the thing we remember him most for? In Roosevelt's second term, he was more aggressive and he still he still picked his fights uh, carefully, but he did but he did pick some fights and he did fight harder against uh, Uncle Joe and Nelson Aldrich. Uh, than he than he had in his first term, uh, particularly over railroad regulation, but there was still very much the same Roosevelt. He would he would fight and fight, and then, you know, he couldn't he didn't see his way to to passing the bill, and then he would he you know go behind the scenes and compromise. And many of the reformers were furious at him uh, for what they felt were his compromises, even in his second term. Uh, but he you know he he. he Drives straight through, finishes up his term, uh, says you know that he's not going to serve a, a third term, uh, and you know handpicks uh, uh, William Taft uh, to succeed him. When Taft came to power, Roosevelt went off to Africa and Europe to uh, to give uh, you know for a year and a half to give Taft some space. And Taft did what Roosevelt did. He worked with the conservatives who were in power. He worked with Nelson Aldrich and Uncle Joe. He'd take rides with them in his, in his uh, little white uh, steam-driven car that, uh, I'm not sure it was white, but steam-driven car. They'd talk policy and they'd, they'd talk about, well, what are we gonna do about the fallout and these, these insurgents, you know, how are we gonna keep, the, uh, keep these things going? Um, Meanwhile, the progressive, LaFollette's progressive insurgency was gaining steam. When he came to the Senate, he was just a lone figure. People, uh, uh, 
ridiculed him, you know, thought he's going nowhere. And, but his, his, these tactics, these aggressive tactics worked. They drew people to his cause. Uh, he, his, his allies won primary elections. And this progressive insurgency uh, called, it was actually LaFalle who popularized the term progressive because there was no label uh, before then. It started to gain force. So now Roosevelt comes back from Europe and Africa and he sees this polarization that's, that's taken place, that Taft has not successfully uh, held on to, uh, the, you know, held to the middle as he had during his presidency. And in fact, it was probably impossible at that time. It worked early on before all this polarization, but at that time you couldn't, you couldn't be in the middle. You had to choose a side. And he saw that Taft had chosen the conservative side. And he saw this as a betrayal. He also changed himself. The, whatever the country felt was, was kind of the way he felt. So, so Bob LaFalle would be out in front kind of trying to pull people this way, and, and the conservatives would be out back trying to hold the country back, and Roosevelt would be right there at the, on the crest of the wave. And so he actually, when he returned, was more progressive than when he had been president. And he sort of embraced this ethos. And he too chose a side, but he now chose the progressive side, then ultimately ran for president against Taft as the progressive leader, much to LaFollette's you know, uh, dismay, because LaFollette was trying to run for president as a progressive leader. So the two of them, these two progressive leaders, now were, were, di were, were now running against each other uh, for first the Republican nomination, and then when Roosevelt didn't get the nomination and felt, in fact, that he'd been cheated out of the nomination because he felt that the, the political machines had, had used tricks to, to take the, the, the Republican nomination away from him, uh, then decided to do what he had always accused LaFalle of doing, doing, and that's bolting the Republican Party. And in fact, he bolted LaFalle stayed, stayed Republican. Uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, as everyone uh, knows, started the, we call it the Bull Moose Party, but the official name was uh, the Progressive Party of the United States. And we end up with this very famous three-way election in 1912 that then produces Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat, uh, and, and who we then associate many of these specific uh, progressive reforms uh, as much with him as with anyone else. I mean, and he embraced, I mean, at his, after he wins, he comes out and says, it's time for uh, all progressive, whatever political affiliation you have, to come together and forge a new era. Well, exactly. I mean, Wilson was also influenced by these changes at the time, and he was more cerebral about it than Theodore Roosevelt, but he had been conservative, you know, before he became governor of New Jersey. In fact, it was the, the, the conservative political bosses in New Jersey hand-picked him and put him, you know, not, you know, chose him for their nominee because they felt that he would represent the the conservative interests and the political machine interests. Uh, it was at that time in, uh, in 1910 that, that Wilson started to belatedly embrace the progressive ideas that LaFollette and some other Democrats like uh, William Jennings Bryan uh, were supporting. And so he becomes a progressive leader, but he didn't start out that way. Uh, and then, you know, I think another important point that people don't remember is that once he became president and once he was pushing for these, these, these tremendous changes through Congress, you know, from the in income taxes to uh, labor laws um, to antitrust laws the, uh, and ultimately women's suffrage, um, these were supported not, these were not pushed through by the Democrats over the heads of the Republicans. There were a lot of progressive Repu Republicans, mainly from La Follette's faction, who were working with progressive Democrats and they were opposed by conservative Democrats and conservative Republicans uh, at that time. So it was this bipartisan progressive alliance that really pushed through uh, the, the famous changes that we associate with uh, Woodrow Wilson's uh, administration. Yeah, and so much of, the, of what's happening at that time, again, it's, it's sort of hard for us to remember uh, the significance of some of this because some of it is obscure, like the introduction of the income tax, we get that, but also the introduction of directly elected senators, that's actually much more significant than just how senators are elected. It begins to establish the notion of one man, one vote in a much more tangible way, it does lead to women's suffrage in many other respects. All of the discussion around child labor laws that hadn't existed, I mean, on this whole, all these different fronts, and not just the reforms themselves, but also just the idea that it's the role of government to intervene into these private matters of, of citizens, uh, of who gets to vote uh, and under what circumstances and what your work life should be. And so even though the, 
the, the policies themselves may seem a little arcane or obscure. They actually represent a fairly revolutionary change in the nature of government itself. Uh, absolutely, and you know, I think even tariff reform, even it, it seems arcane, but the, the fundamental issue of tariff reform was that the, the tariffs were driven by corporations, essentially. They would, they would go in there into Nelson Aldrich's committee, and they would write the legislation that you know, gave, you know, gave their industry favored tariffs. And they would, they would, they would work it out in minute detail with, uh, with the, the sugar tariff, for example, like how many, you know, what percentage of refinement would, um, would result, you know, would get what kind of tariff. And they would do that to basically crush their, their smaller competitors and uh, take advantage over, their, over international comp competitors and consolidate uh, their influence. So the, the tariff, uh, what the tariffs were about, what the fight was about, it was about corporate influence in government, and that's something. Even though we don't, the tariff doesn't play the same role there. Uh, we we have it today. We have it a lot of times. We have it, for, for example, with corporate subsidies, which are really it's really the same thing. It's really the same fight that we were fighting back then. Which is a little bit like again the uh, the the broader discussion that we're having in America right now. That is still about size of government, big government versus small government, role of government. Also, I think very interesting, uh, again, not to overdraw the historical parallels, uh, but we now do go into this period of wondering uh, what happens with this incredibly historic, whether we like him or not, but this incredibly historic president of Barack Obama as a young, very young person, still in the prime of his life, who will end up as an ex-president, but with an enormous following uh, in America in, in some respects, somewhat like Teddy Roosevelt, uh, what role is he going to play uh, over the next 30 years, probably, that he will remain an important figure in American life? Uh, so just as the question uh, existed for Roosevelt. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. I think, we're going to, I think we're going to start seeing a lot of changes, actually, even though, even though now it seems, that, you know, the, the, the world seems dark and it seems like, well, Congress just can't do anything and nothing's going to happen is, uh, uh, in the foreseeable future. You know, that was how people felt back in, the, uh, in, in 1906 and 1908. Uh, there was the same sense that Congress is never going to change. And then four years uh, later, it was you know, uh, changes that, were, that seemed unimaginable, ag uh, unimaginable four years earlier. Uh, and uh, I think, I don't know if it'll take four years or eight years or 12 years, uh, but I, I think the the times uh, call, and I think the country will ultimately rise uh, to the call, and uh, we'll see the kind of uh, kind of dramatic changes that, that that we need to deal with the crises of the of, the, of today. The question is just which way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's good point. Before we finish, um, it, you're not a you're not a trained classic historian. You're not a longtime journalist. You've written more software than literature. Uh, uh, you had an earlier book about politics, but this book, uh, which is splendidly done, it, I have, just have to say, just splendidly done uh, um, with a kind of granular research and wonderful writing, uh, and it just sort of sprung out of the, out of the ether. How did that happen? Uh, well, uh, thank you, first of all. Uh, the, uh, I, I assure you that it did not spring out of the ether. I wish it had sprung out of the ether, but uh, there were a lot of grueling, grueling hours went into that ether before this thing came out. Uh, the, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was a blogger, starting, starting actually with, with uh, the election of 2008, and you know, it, it achieved some attention and some success as a blogger. Uh, first, uh, and then went from there to this to the, my previous book that you mentioned, which was uh, it was called Blowing Smoke, and I was talking about this and figuring out why when it seems like everyone should go, you know, why when it seems like the Republicans should moderate to to be more successful, they would go to the right, and they would still be more successful. You know, like the the Republican, you didn't just start with a Tea Party, the Republican Revolution of 1994. And so I was trying to figure out how this was happening and how they'd been so successful and how a lot of the ideas uh, were working so well. Um, and so, so in many ways, that was really a book about insurgent politics and uh, the, the, how they work and how they can be effective. But I think a lot of the, the, thought, that would, the, the, the thought behind it and a lot of the history work that I did for that first book uh, would, ended up being, ended up kind of taking that and, and blowing that out and writing more of a, of a, of a full-blown uh, history book for this one. So I don't think they were uh, entirely isolated.
And when the Washington Post <laughs> reviewed your book uh, not all that long ago, uh, it was written, Unreasonable Men invites comparison with another book on the same era, Doris Kearns Goodwin's The Bully Pulpit, uh, and then it goes on to say from the reviewer, if I had to choose between them, I would go with Unreasonable Men. That's pretty heady stuff. I, I was, I was, it, was, it was a great honor. Now, I, I should add that the, the reason they, they went with mine was by virtue of brevity and price. Uh, <laughs> 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 he, he basically said, these are two great books, uh, you know, and you know, you know, buy this one to save money. Um, but I don't just, think it was quite as simple as that. <laughs> but but even, being, even being compared uh, to her and to her book, you know, which particularly you know, I felt I didn't know she was coming, writing this book, and I, I found out you know, right as I was sending in uh, uh, the final draft of mine, you know, uh, her, her book was launched. And I was like, oh my goodness, you know, like how can I, you know, you, you, writing about very different books, but about, you know, about the, many of the same people, about the same era. And I felt like, how can I compete with her? And, and I can't really, but I, I, was, I was very honored by this, this book review. Well, it's a marvelous book, and you've done a marvelous job of uh, reframing this critical period of time in our history. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, thanks so much. The book is Unreasonable Men.